Yeah, that'll be a fun one. That one's going to be in Richmond, Virginia. And the whole point is, um, oh, Edward wanted to be. I'll promote Edward to panelists too. I think he wanted to do that. Hi, Edward. Hello, how are you? Good, how are you? Very good, very good. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm uh, excited to be uh, a panelist, I suppose. It's, it's quite <laughs> Um, I've only watched from the sidelines sort of thing. But um, listen, I, I wanted to say that I really did get a lot out of the course as far as the um, instructional design content and that sort of thing went. found it extremely useful. Oh, excellent. And, uh, you know, I, I really support what the course is about. So, you know, it was, it was a pleasure to, um, to take part in it. Um, and uh, what I'd like to do, um, you know, I'm sure that you have – um, maybe more than you, well, perhaps you have more than you need, but I, I'd like to, um, talk offline perhaps about, uh, perhaps improving the user experience or ideas about yeah, for sure. if, if you guys do the course again, sort we of thing. Um, yeah, we're doing as, it well. as, yeah. As someone who went through it, I know the, what they call friction points for yeah. me sort of thing. And, uh, you know, I'd love to talk about how we could maybe, um, ease some of those friction points just a little bit. Overall, the course, the, the, like I said, the course I found, especially from the instructional design point of view, content was wonderful. And um, what I would, what I'd love to do is um, talk with you guys about maybe ways of getting a couple more people through to the end. Mm -hmm. You know, I, like, as, like I said, as, as I was going through the course, there were some things that I know I got hung up on, and it was, I'm sure what I got hung up on, others got hung up on as well, sort of thing. Absolutely. And you can kind of tell when you see the class go through, we were getting you know, hundreds of posts, and then, and then everybody yeah. got really bogged down in, in module yeah. two. And, you know, it seems like if you made it through module two, you had a pretty good chance of getting through module three if you made it through module two. So it seems like, you know, those were like big hurdles for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bottlenecks. There were bottlenecks to it. And uh, yeah. the, the, um, the, what would you, CCR, you know, the. Yeah, the College of Career Writing Standard. Yeah, all, yeah. all that sort of stuff. It was definitely, uh, I, I found that a bit unfortunate because there's all the instructional design material, which is wonderful stuff. There's all of the um, just contributing lesson plans. And I found that the aligning the lesson plans with this, this um, system, I suppose, mm -hmm. was, was in some ways more challenging than anything else in the course, which is, yeah. which is a bit unfortunate because, you know, Really, it's it's the instructional design that's the good stuff, and then it's actually making the content that, that's the good stuff. That's right. where the focus should be, and it was a bit of a shame. Uh, no fault of the designers of the course, because it's just the content itself is challenging. Yeah. But it was definitely a bit of a shame that aligning it with those standards seemed uh, maybe more work than anything else in the course. Yeah, and you know, I think that's a really good point for us to dive into, and we are, just to kind of – um, lead the witnesses here that hopefully will be giving us um, a lot of input. Um, we're, we've already arranged a canvas. We're going to issue the course. Re, re, um, uh, what's the word? Re Not reissue. <laughs> Reoffer whatever right. uh, in the fall. In fact, we have a start date of September 12th through December 4th, so we even know the dates. Beautiful. And um, just some of the things like Jay and, Arv and JR and I were talking offline. We, we'd like to use press books for all the content going forward, which then you can dump it into a PDF. Um, which I think would be a lot of, not PDF, but um, EPUB or even a PDF actually for that. Sure, sure. Um, sure. So offline, offloading a lot of the content. And then I really like what JR did and he, he did the section on OER. And I don't know if you remember, he had a 10 item, um, like uh, take, take a self-assessment of this. If you do well on it, you may as well just skip this content. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that would be a nice way to say, okay, you scored, like you got a three out of 10, so you probably should spend some time reading this section. Yeah, um, but if you're an instructional designer and you know about Merrill's first principles or you got, you know, you're wired in on all that stuff, you can skip over it. So I, yeah. I think some of those types of things, those are just like some of the early suggestions we're already getting. And right. I'd love definitely to, uh, um, to, um, you know, to do that. Oh, so Jesse's asking, will the September, yeah, it'll be exactly the same designing modules for adult learners. Yep. 
And another thing we're doing, in fact, on Monday, I certainly want to, don't want to jinx myself or get anyone too excited, but on Monday, I do have the opportunity to talk to a funder. And um, it's someone who's in the adult ed space. And whether or not that person is actually going to give us any <laughs> funding is a, one thing. But if nothing else, we're, we're certainly going to be able to have the opportunity to hear what they're interested in funding and making sure that we're aligning. And that's one of the re you know, we, we, a lot of people part that we're partnering with are in the adult ed space. Right. So long-winded answer to the question that came in in the chat room, we'll be spending quite a bit of time um, continuing to focus on adult education because that's kind of going to be our niche. I, I think the, maybe, maybe I'm just reading into the question maybe a little bit too much, but it says designing modules. And so I think one of our big focuses this time is, uh, as, as we all found out, it can take a lot of time and energy just to develop a single lesson. Uh, and a module is usually a composition of, depending on your context, a composition of, say, five lessons. Um, so if the question is if we're looking at designing modules or, you know, going to be designing lessons again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the approach will probably be the same, um, and mainly just because of the um, constraints of a 12-week experience. There's really only so much a designer, as you're saying, Edward did a great job saying, you know, there's just a lot to absorb anyway, and so when you get down to the designing of it, um, you know, it'll probably be uh, pr pretty similar in terms of what the deliverable will look like. Good stuff, good stuff. It, yeah. You know, it, it's, it's wonderful, the end product. You know, so many times you do a lot of work and what you sort of create is a lot of paper in a sense. And here what we're creating is, um, it's, it felt really good anyways. It, it was uh, it's something inspiring to work towards. It's very compelling, isn't it? Like I think of that sometimes when it's like, oh, do I want to go to the discussion board and read 50 posts today? Yeah. But at the same time, it's like, wow, we've got 1,300 people who are all pounding away on the same, or at least, at least maybe not pounding away at the same time, but at least... Yeah. Our collective conscience is trying to, uh, right. you know, to work on it. So I, I think it was some engaged conversation and some deep conversation, and the feedback that I saw participants giving each other, as well as what was coming from the SMEs, was everything I saw was just fabulous. So yeah. Um, well, like we gave it about ten minutes to see if anybody else was joining. I'm, I'm a little concerned about Lisi because Lisi um, certainly has been really active in the discussion boards, and I. Wanted her to be able to respond if people had any questions. But did anybody have any specific questions about their project that they would like to uh, talk about? I don't know, Edward or J Janet, did you want to? Um, for my project, JR, you were very helpful today, uh, helping me with the attribution um, statement with my videos. Uh, so I went onto YouTube and then I, I added the statement that you recommended. So thank you so much for that. And, uh, and I enjoyed the clarifying questions that you asked uh, about why not have a read aloud. Um, and that, that was awesome for me. I loved seeing the collaborative nature of everything. I was very excited every time I got my notification about Canvas um, updates. <laughs> I was always looking, like, who's writing back? Who's reading my, my work? And, you know, as teachers, we really are closed in a, a very quiet room by ourselves much of the time. Uh, so it's, it's wonderful to collaborate. Another thing I wanted to say was that, um, Jennifer, when you said uh, keep calm and design on, uh, it really helped um, myself and helped many people who may have been feeling stuck at that point, you know, and it, it, you know, you need to continue designing, even if you're feeling overwhelmed or if you're feeling like you are in the bottleneck that Edward mentioned, um, you know, the aligning to the standards is an issue. And many times we do, we don't design we don't do a backwards design and that's maybe it's a Canadian thing, but it's basically, you know, you, you think about what it is you want to create and then you think about your learner and then you become inspired by the content and it's like a, a backwards design. So then you, you think about, okay, how does this align and what, what can I change to make it line up with the standards that are present? I knew I wanted to create something that would be accessible for someone like Jeff. And I knew it couldn't be anything that he would have to read. I wanted it to be something that would break the ice and uh, allow the teachers to make a connection with their learner. And so I knew it would align with the standards of language and oral, well, oral language, and I knew it was a text. But that's my background, and I know all about that, and maybe it's something that people aren't familiar with. Um, I've been 
<laughs> actually it's been like keeping me up at night I'm thinking of ways to to make that bottleneck better mm -hmm. uh, and I would also like to be a part of that conversation if, if you'd have me uh, I'd really like to think of a way to empower educators to feel like they can continue with their creative spark while aligning yeah. I think that once you start with the alignment <laughs> If you think, okay, this is what I want to do, how does it align, and then you create it, I think in my mind anyway, my creative process is if I, if I do it backwards, it helps me. I don't know. What, what's your opinion of that? I see some nodding, but I'm not sure what you think really. Where, where I'm coming from is someone who went through the course, exactly what you said. Um, when I was going through the alignment process and going, okay, I have to create something within this alignment, I, I flattened out, basically. And what I needed to do was go, you know what, I'm going to do something that I want to do that I know in the end is going to be good. And once I've done it, then I'm going to go back and go, where can I fit this in? And then how can I tweak it sort of thing? So, so exactly as you said, it was the, it was the backwards thing where first for me, it was first get what I was inspired to do out and then figure out how to massage it and learn more about the alignment. Starting with the alignment and trying to build from that, I found the creativity wasn't there for me. And as, as designers, you know, we're taught to look for gaps and we're taught to, to, to look for those gaps. So, but we do that before we begin the design process, you know, and a lot of times when I'm in my master's program, they're talking to us about finding that gap and then deciding how to fill it. But really this is backwards. So we would come from our inspirational point and then decide, okay, how do we make this better? by aligning it to the standards and filling the gaps after we've created a, a almost a i don't know a framework a prototype that's how i did what mm -hmm. i did yeah, i don't want to use prototype because i know that's what we're using but yeah, yeah. no it, it was it was first the first getting the idea sketched out so you can actually go okay this this might work you know what i mean and so yeah a framework a prototype whatever whatever it is first getting something out there and then going with this, you know, um, where does it fit? I, I definitely found, the, as, as you're saying, that, that approach worked. Now, on, on, a different, on a different note, sorry, I don't mean to sidetrack, but I wanted to say, as you mentioned, Jeff, whoever had developed the personas, um, those hooked me. <laughs> I, I was interested in the course. I thought it was wonderful. You know, I, I started the course, and I read the personas, and I sat down and went, oh, my God, I have to finish this. Yeah. It's, it's serious. It's not. You know, it's really cool. We've got Jason that's in the um, chat room. Jason's on our board. And I don't know if you guys know the whole story, but we started out the first time we offered this course, we had like 20 people. Then we decided to even go smaller. We had 12 people. And so in that first cohort, what the very, very first time we did it, we had a professor out of um, Indiana University, Elizabeth Bowling, worked with our subject matter expert who was with Grace Centers of Hope, which is a um, homeless shelter in, um, in Michigan that offers adult education. And so we had a subject matter expert and then this faculty member, Elizabeth Bowling, wrote, I think they had four of them. Mm -hmm. so they did the first four. And so John used those four as kind of a template and then they, I think they, we've been word up to six. I think they added up the prison scenario, prison incarcerated. I can't remember what the second one was. Um, but yeah, and you know, what's really interesting is no, the prior cohorts, and Jason could probably uh, back me up on this, they didn't it, it didn't click it, it's the first two couple of cohorts and I don't know if it's because we didn't open we didn't start the, the session with you know the the course with them and it was more of like an after you know maybe even after we did the standards <laughs> really really like boring everybody to tears but I think we you know our decision to, to front load that and use that as part of the um, explaining the context and who the learners are and like hitting hitting that one um, in, initially I think that really was Pretty compelling. At least you could tell from even the discussion discussion boards, people were saying, you know, they actually, you guys actually picked people that you've been following, and that was our goal. Is like every yeah. every time you take start a new module, is to have that person in the back of your mind um, that you're designing too. So yeah, yeah, yeah. there was it was the most powerful part of the course for me. It was, it was good to, as you say, fun learning because that's what that's what kept me in myself. That's, that's great to hear. And then Lauren, so, Lauren said she had yeah, a question. Lauren. Yeah, go ahead. Oops, we can't hear you. Hmm. 
Nope, I don't think. Can you, you can hear us though? Okay, try talking again. Let's see if we can. No, sorry. Um, so I, I saw Lauren and Jesse uh, chat just very briefly in the aside on, on the chat uh, window. And Jesse's comment was, I actually did the opposite and dove directly into the CCR standards. Um, and Lauren did confirm, I did that too, and I was going to comment on that. So while we try to sort out Lauren's audio, maybe we could promote Jesse and, and get Jesse's input sure, and then absolutely. come back to Lauren. Okay, I'm going to promote Jesse. Okay, and you know what? I'm going to mute a few folks. Maybe that, I don't know if that's going to make a difference. Now we're really getting the Brady Bunch windows going here. Okay, Je let's see, Jesse, if we can hear you. Okay, Jesse, want to give it a try? Hi, guys, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you great. Awesome. Um, yeah, I was just talking in the side chat. I am a little behind. I actually just emailed Jennifer yesterday because I'm busy with my own master's program, but I dove directly into the CCR standards because I figured that would be easier instead of going the opposite route. I know Edward was saying that you started designing first and then kind of went back to see where you could fit that in and I took the opposite approach. So uh, I chose a math topic. Uh, I'm going to do my lesson on the Pythagorean theorem. So I just kind of picked that and I'm going to dive into that this week. So yeah, I don't know if you saw from the list, uh, we had a roster of um, Maurice, uh, uh, proposed, not proposed, like kind of proposals, uh, prototypes that have been turned in already. And I think we only have two math so far, so that's great that you're going to tackle a math-related <laughs> subject. So um, I'm just curious, so you're at Wayne State, right? Yes. So yep. Monica, who's on our board, is, uh, is your faculty at Wayne State, right? Yes. So yeah, I actually uh, took her course last semester. Oh, that's great. great course. Yep. So I'll put you on the spot a little bit. Um, Monica's probably the best designer I've ever run across. She And, and when I say that, I'm really... When I think of a good, good designer, they really design the instructional experience, what the learner is doing really, really well. And kind of what Edward was saying to you, really always have that learner in your, in your sites. And, you know, well, there's all this other stuff floating around, like your objectives or your learning outcomes or whatever it is and topics you need to cover. You know, you're really thinking how you're going to take your learner from point A to point B. And so I think that's really one of the huge strengths of Monica. So I'm just kind of curious. In the course in the instructional design course you had with her like how did you how did she approach that piece of it like teaching you guys to design the instructional experience it was actually funny because as soon as I started this course it reminded me a lot of her class that she taught online um, she did the same thing I was always think about the learners she basically had us come up with a couple different names and create this persona for each person and like we basically just made up this person is a 25 year old college student that is struggling with this, this and that. And we kind of typed up uh, exactly what each person is doing in their life, what their struggles are, their goals, their ambitions, and kind of went from there. So it was interesting. It was definitely an interesting course. I learned a lot from her. She's great. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, it's really hard to teach instructional design because you start to try to codify things like as soon as you try to explain to somebody how to do it and that's really not what design is. Um, you know, the, the really seasoned and people who really know what they're doing. They love constraints. They love, you know, they yeah. love a little challenge thrown in. Whereas, you know, when you're start, first starting out and, and you're trying to develop a scenario, you want to strip out all the complexity and just, you know, and so I think that's what I think is cool about the way Monica approaches design is like embrace the complexity right. and, um, and, and, you know, use that. And so when you, when you find something that's maybe some would perceive a, a stumbling block, you know, some how find a way to leverage that. And one thing to also point out, I don't know if you knew this um, or if everybody knew this, but that's where John Bakke came from is Wayne State University. And so he was the person who uh, put the that first module on personas and stuff together for us. So that's probably where you might see a thread of, of Monica Monica coming through in the course. Yep. So hey, Lisi, how you doing? Let's see if I can unmute you. I think uh, it's true, but I'm glad to, to join you. 
Excellent. So did uh, now we've got Lisa, we've got Kaya here, we've got JR, some so other subject matter experts maybe popping in. Um, and certainly people who are in the class are already subject matter experts. You're already, a lot of you are already doing this job on a daily basis. So uh, certainly no offense um, directed at anyone um, by, by calling some people subject matter experts and, and not others. But uh, I keep asking, does anybody have any questions about their project? Um, Lauren, did you have any, she, did you decide to log out? Uh, she's gonna just switch computers quickly, so um, yeah, we'll be we'll be right back. <laughs> I'm just gonna give it a try. Okay. So, does anybody else have any questions about their projects or um, any other things that you wanted to to think through? No. Quite great. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Looks like oh, Jr. This is your job. You're like the <laughs> <laughs> really read the read the question from the audience. <laughs> you want to feel that one? We've got a. Have any questions come in about standards? Yeah, you missed some good ones. Uh, well, we're not questions necessarily, but like um, thinking bigger picture. Like, how do we align to the standards without making the standards a stumbling block? I guess is probably a way to summarize it. What are your thoughts on that, Lacey? Well, I agree. Um, and standards are hard to interpret sometimes because there are different levels and uh, unless you're very, very familiar with them, which most students on this MOOC were not, uh, it's a very difficult thing. As a, as a practitioner, I don't really pay much attention to standards, frankly. Um, when I'm choosing materials, I like to see a level, but I don't really um, go to standards first. And I think most instructors just want to see the material. But in order to adhere to what people um, like to do when they select materials, uh, they like to see standards. But frankly, uh, the material is far more important. And if the standard is not quite correct, people are going to look at the material beforehand and not go by standards. They're going to go by content. So how do you think we can do that uh, in the future, Lacey, when we um, offer this course again? Uh, we, we, we somehow want to introduce that there are, is this concept of standards that are out there. But how yeah. can we uh, introduce that without getting bogged down before they start designing the, the lessons themselves? Like, uh, any thoughts on, on how we could work on that in our next iteration of this course? Maybe uh, provide samples of uh, here's an activity in your course. Um, and do a kind of a little practice. Here's an activity, what standard would you give it? And have a discussion on that. One, one person might have it in one standard, one another, and that kind of dialogue between uh, people who are developing would be very interesting, I think. Yeah, exam and hopefully that might be one uh, really nice advantage of doing uh, this class is we're going to have a lot of good examples, hopefully, um, there. We, we, we will, we will, yeah. Another thing we're working on, uh, we've, we've been working with the behind the scenes with OER Commons folks. I'm sure you've all noticed that when you try to align your lesson, it's like the only option is college and career, I'm sorry, um, Common Core State Standards. And so they, I think they gave us an invoice, not, a, not an invoice because we can't pay it, but they gave us a, an estimate of what it would cost to include the college and career readiness standards into OER Commons. And it was, it seemed reasonable to me. It was like 2,500 bucks. But I think it's mainly a matter of massaging the um, Common Core. So hopefully by this fall when we open the course, um, that will be a pull down, which I think will help maybe to your point, Lacey, where we'll focus on the lesson and then not necessarily as an afterthought, but more like, okay, well now let's make sure we, we've explained to others and I understand where my lesson falls into the big scheme of um, the college. Yeah, an example of how to find, first develop your content and then match it to standards. And I think uh, that would make it easier for people who are not really familiar with the standards. Right. Say, Ruth, I don't know, um, do you have um, a, the ability to talk? I, I see you posted a question. Ruth is really, really well versed in the College of Career Readiness Standards. Um, did you want to make any comments on this? I don't know. I'm gonna, you know what, I'm going to promote you. We, to also, we also have Lauren back. As, oh, okay. Well, so as we get uh, Ruth set up with the hosting, we can uh, hear from Lauren. Yeah, Lauren, you want you, um, to give it a try? Sure. Is it working now? It is. Yep. Perfect. Oh, good. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I was just kind of piggybacking off of people's comments earlier, but I'm sure the moment has passed. <laughs> but um, I was just uh, going to say, 
uh, basically what someone said earlier about the uh, standards being difficult when you're not quite sure. Uh, at least for me, I'm, I'm a high school teacher and I see the curriculum from September to June. So it's very difficult for me to see one standard in one 30 minute lesson and see the entire product and how it's going to come out in the end and where it should be starting up from. I don't know the student's background and things like that. Um, so maybe someone had just mentioned um, using examples. And as Lisa, Lisa just said, um, that you usually don't look at the standards, you look at the content. Um, so I think that was also one of the most difficult things for me was being able to find something that I could teach that related to those standards because I also chose a standard first. Um, whereas maybe it would have been a bit easier to think, oh, what are you good at? What do you want to teach? Which I should have just done that. <laughs> and found a standard to align it with. Um, and it's funny because I do that all the time with my high school teaching and I don't know why it didn't occur to me in this project. <laughs> but, um, maybe because we saw the standards first and I thought, oh, that's the order that it goes in. You know, it's a new field for me. Um, so I guess one of my biggest questions that I've been asking and trying to get some feedback on in the forums, um, I'm also a little bit behind. I did my first semester of grad school. And yeah, uh, yeah. yay. <laughs> um, so I just finished. So now I'll definitely finish this project but by the due date. But um, I am going to do the present perfect, a small lesson on the present perfect. Um, one of my uh, focus person, was Mary who's an ELL learner I have experience teaching ELLs and um, that's a lesson that I'm comfortable with so I thought I would teach that and I was really stuck on the part where it says it needs to be applied to social studies or science mm -hmm. so um, I've found a way to kind of force its incorporation like using an article where they'd have to find uses of it but I'm wondering if that's absolutely necessary or could we teach a specifically grammar lesson grammar-based lesson. I'm, I'm going to pass that one to Lisey. Go for it. <laughs> That's <laughs> up your alley. You know how I feel about that. <laughs> uh, the, the, all we know about andragogy, which is a study of how adults learn and about um, experiments about how adults learn differently than children. There are a lot of similarities, but adults only learn when they're what you're teaching them relates to either their interest mm -hmm. or their goal or sometimes to the demand in their life. So to the extent that you can do, when, when would you use the present perfect? I mean, it's all over the place. Exactly. When would you apply it? And I would say you know, in a resume, it would be a good idea to use the present perfect. I've done this, I've done that, I've done the other. Um, think of something, and I call it a hook, that would hook the interest and the participation and then say, okay, now that you've done this, look at what, what this structure is and let's practice that. Okay. So yeah, I think you're, and also was there a part, kind of part B in your question as far as like the social studies science tie-in, is that right? Oh yeah, I just, it's, it mentioned a lot of um, the contextual reading, some sort of oh. application of social studies or science. I kept seeing that come up. So I, I was trying to find a way that I could make that happen. With science, I'm sure, you know, they think we have discovered this and up till and now history, we, have, we know or we have done blah, blah, blah. History is full of it too. Yeah. <laughs> Look at what has happened. Look at right. what has occurred as a result of, and um, it's just, it's, the idea is take the grammar and then put it in context and mm -hmm. then work on the practice of the grammar without telling them today we're going to learn the present perfect. Right, yeah, of course. They're out of there. Yeah. Okay, okay thank you. Uh -huh. That's a great question. And um, what's really interesting too, we, when we were putting the course together and thinking about standards, we actually pulled the, uh, the subject matter, I think about 21 subject matter experts. Should we align the college and career readiness standards or should we pivot and just align straight to the GED, which even though they are on the back, they, their, their standards are on the back of the college and career readiness standards, they do use next-gen science standards, which brings up a whole nother, you know, so when you're talking about science, yeah. I think a lot of people get, we had this come up at the beginning of this class, uh, we had some folks that were interested in designing some science lessons, um, and that's really not part of the college and career readiness standards because it does fall under, it's more like you're saying if there are like readings associated with science that where you're teaching like English language arts or, or literacy topics. Mm -hmm. So it's a little confusing. 
But, um, you know, that's something really, I think we'll always keep that on the back burner is um, if we really are helping people prepare for the GED, are we covering those science topics and social studies topics in the same way that they will be tested? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's something, like I said, it's, it's always a clunky thing to me is the way we, th we th conceive of the science and the social studies topics when we think about them in terms of the college and career readiness standards. Because again, it is tied more to the, the yeah, of course. Standards. yeah, yeah. So. Um, and I, I think that bridges nicely into what, what uh, Ruth's question was. So do people find that they incorporate standards that they are most comfortable with? Uh, I think in general, I avoid things that I am not as strong at, but I know that uh, is not necessarily good for the students because the students are supposed to be exposed to a range of, of different things. So um, uh, are we expected to develop mastery in more than uh, those that I may tend to teach to or what what people's thoughts are there um, I think generally for you know just for me very quickly from a, a recent ID student perspective was that yeah it's really easy to pick something that I was interested in but I found um, for my own learning of, of how to go through an instructional design process having a topic or a, a type of learning context that was outside of my scope of expertise uh, really made me learn a lot more about how instructional design works in, in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's been really interesting too, the convergence of instructional designers and then practitioners in adult education, because we're all doing the same thing-ish. <laughs> it's just funny how, you know, for, for all the designers, we were thrilled when we saw the standards, because that's what you, usually when you come into a project, your first task is to create st the standards you're going to, you know, <laughs> we don't call them standards, but we call, you know, you do a, a needs analysis or a task analysis or whatever it may be. And, and those are, it's, that's like the first part of your job on most projects. So we were like, cool, that work's already been done. <laughs> we can now design from that. Um, so that was kind of an interesting, actually, I don't know how, how geeky people are or if you're interested in this, but maybe JR and K you could attest. I think our design meetings were pretty interesting. Um, to, those are all recorded so you could go back and see where a lot of our thought process came from and you know you could see where we made decisions for example we had a huge discussion in module two do we lead with the standards or do we lead with the topic and it sounds like from what everyone's saying we maybe made the back, a backwards choice because that was the topic of discussion in, in multiple um, design meetings on, on where we where we put the standards. Um, but Ruth, did you want to go ahead and elaborate on your question? And then I think JR started oh. to summarize a little bit. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can, yeah. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, my question was basically um, if other people, you know, found that they tend to design lessons that are geared more towards what their strengths are than necessarily what um, should be covered across the board. And I think that that's, you know, natural that we kind of all do that. But um, I think, you know, the message that I got from um, I think she froze. Hmm. I think we, she got halfway hmm. through her thought. Okay, I think she's okay. Um, in the meantime, if uh, you want to include uh, Sharon on the panel, uh, sure. we got a question through the, the Q&A channel from okay. Sharon. I just promoted Sharon. I wonder how many people we can promote. We maybe hit, are we hitting a, a max here? Nope, there she comes. Hey Sharon, how you doing? Actually, Sharon, you were part of our very first cohort, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, I wrote the question. <laughs> so um, we're going to be just going ahead and putting something out there pretty soon. I have to do it pretty soon, and then you will just respond. We'll, you know, massage it a little bit and throw it back up and out there and so on that's the um that's the rest of the weeks is that right exactly yeah so um it's kind of funny because we have seven modules and it that's probably again back to edward's point at the beginning i think it'd be really interesting for us to try to quantify how much time you should spend in each module because like module seven could be a minute <laughs> it's just if you've made your revisions you can just hit the um, submit button and, and be done with it so really if you kind of are just 
diving in right now in module five, going where you're opening up open author for the first time and you're putting things together. Really all you're doing from that point on is then posting it for some feedback in the discussion forum. And then in module six, it's um, we're giving everybody the opportunity to look at others work. And then that's kind of a twofold goal. One being you're offering feedback within module six to others. And then also, I think it's always a great learning experience to see what others have done and then take some ideas from what they've done to modify your own work. And then so to the extent that you have time and the interest level to massage your prototype that you turned in module five, all you're really gonna do is go back in and hit the edit button and open author, make a few changes and then save it and you're done, yeah. Sounds good to me. <laughs> Yeah, but so. it's easy to keep trying to, you know, make it a little better, fix this, change this a little bit. So. Yeah, yeah, and it's, um, it, it, you know, it's pretty easy to go in and edit uh, with, an, with an opener. I think there's been a couple questions on that, and I think I, I posted a couple different places. As a, I just did a quick screen share. It literally is a matter of hitting the edit button, and it reopens your, uh, your document, yeah. so. So it looks like it saves everything you do as a separate, almost like a separate um, document, you know, a separate thing. Because I ended up with nine things, and I thought, oh, that's because I went in and did just a little bit, and then it's, it saved it again, and so it kept stacking up. But you know, I just I, I don't, yeah, let me, let me go in and look at that, because it, it hasn't been doing that for me. So I, there is a way to copy, you know, that's that whole idea with uh, keeping, keeping things in OER Commons is, for example, if I want to fork your, you know, to take it off in another direction, I can do what you just described. But it sh when you hit the edit, it should just be editing your original one. So maybe there, maybe you're making a different selection where you're actually copying it, maybe. So let me go in and look at that and see if. Thank you. Yeah. Um, did anybody else have any questions, Chair? Am I missing any of the um, text? I just here? got I just got three in just now. So okay. Take a look here. Um, so, hi. What tips can you give uh, for someone who has only just managed to join the Design for Good program to develop mm -hmm. the most useful course to achieve the uh, objective? I'm not overly overly familiar with the USGED testing. Uh, is there a place to see what the tests look like? Yeah, um, you know, I'll just take a quick stab at it, and then certainly the others on the panel are much more uh, well-versed. If you go to Module 1, um, there is a place where we talk about the, um, the test itself. There's actually a couple different ones now beyond the, the, the GED. Um, but spend a little bit of time there. Um, it may be, I don't want to discourage anybody if you think you have the wherewithal to do, <laughs> from, you know, to, to work on this from now to the end. Uh, but it is a lot. We, we consider it's going to be at least a minimum of 40 hours of, of time on task to, uh, to work through the class and do the lesson. That's what it has been historically when we've offered this class before. Um, so, you know, maybe from what we're hearing tonight, skim through module two in terms of the standards, get a, a, a general understanding of what um, open educational resources are. Uh, spend a little time skimming through module three. Um, that will give you a sense for um, how the WIPIA framework works. And then start diving. I would skip. I would probably skip for the most part module four. Um, you may want to just refer back to it because that's where we describe what the design guide is. But then jump right into module five and just start pounding away on an open author. You know, if that's kind of if you're trying to kind of cut to the chase <laughs> at this late date, that might be a, a possible way to to tackle it. Great. Uh, question number two is from Martin, and I I'm sure that. Uh, I'm sure I've seen Martin quite a bit in the discussion forum. So yeah. um, I'm at wait, but maybe so maybe you've already talked about this. But one of the comments on my prototype was to check if my objectives were measurable. I used Bloom's taxonomy to define the objectives. Uh, is there any advice to ensure me measurability? Uh, no need to promote. Uh, <laughs> I'm not camera ready. Just it, he's in Korea, so That's right. yeah. uh, very very early morning there right now. Yeah, you want you want to take that one, chair, Mr. Designer guy. <laughs> <laughs> you want to take the balloons question? I, I don't know. Okay, I do that. I I think usually so one of the approaches to that measurability question is 
uh, what is the thing that they are producing that you can see? Like, so often when, uh, when I have instructors looking at uh, learning outcomes or learning objectives, uh, a lot of the time we start from that place of, I want my students to understand. And what does it mean to understand? So I, I think very concretely, my background is in industrial arts. So for me, it is this student made a jewelry box and that is something very tactile that I can actually see that they've done with the knowledge that they've acquired. Um, in terms of some of our examples around uh, writing a CV or, or writing their cover letter, that is the measurable aspect. And so when if I construct a, a learning objective with that action condition criteria format, or I think uh, I can't remember now if, state, if we went with the smart thing, it was specific measurable uh, achievable something in time. I always forget the smart project. Uh, it, it, it's something like that. It's pretty close. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> something like that. So, um, so if I think about that action condition criteria, it would be that my learner uh, is able to write a cover letter of one page in length, you know, using <laughs> the set of criteria um, that they've included something related to the job they're applying for or something. That's a, a really skinny version of it, but um, that's one of the ways that I help try to communicate that measurability is that they have an indication of what the output actually is. Um, that's from the ID perspective, but I know things are, are slightly different in different contexts. So I'd love to hear from, from our subject matter experts here as well. Um, let me just uh, piggyback on what JR said. I think you pretty much nailed it. it uh, even though it's your skinny version, it is a pretty good version. <laughs> um, you just give the example of being able to write something. Measurable is whether in the end you are able to actually test it out. Did they really write it? Uh, so if your goal is, if your end product, that's where you have to tie in from your objectives, you have to go to your assessment. You can't have that middle piece. You're tempted to want to start teaching them that, but you just really want to make sure that you can measure that. So yours was a very perfect example in terms of writing a measurable objective. I know we give students lists of verbs, um, but they get lost in those verbs in terms of uh, what is really measurable and what really isn't measurable. So, you know, you give a very good example of measurability is, uh, and but I think the main test for me when I do this, even for my own design or whether I'm teaching, is our measurable objectives are those that can also be assessment tools. So that writing that you mentioned in the objective also needs to become a tool that I can assess uh, to see whether or not you achieve that. So, um, so and then, oh, sorry, oh, go on. Sorry, I just wanted to, um, Sharon. I'm not I, actually. I'm not even able to recreate <laughs> that. Your what you were mentioning, copying it. I just went in and I edited mine, and it it edited it as the same document, and then tying into the the question that came in. Um, there was a question from Deborah Madden asking, can the title of your lesson be edited? And it can. So same thing when you go in and you click on the edit button up in the upper left hand corner, um, you can change the title and then hit save and that will change it to a new one. And maybe when I first um, went in and out a few times and it was creating a bunch of versions. And then when I named it, I think there's only one of those. Oh, okay. I so see. Give it a title. Okay. Know. So, um, okay. I think yeah. it'll be fine. Yeah. Um, and Ruth has, has come back to us. So uh, if we can, <laughs> Ruth, we can uh, hear the question that uh, we've been waiting for. <laughs> Let me unmute her, sorry. Okay, go ahead, Ruth. Sorry. Hi, sorry about that. Um, I lost my internet connection. Um, so what I was referring to is just the tendency that I know I've had in teaching situations where I sort of find that I teach to my strengths. So I'll pick things to cover that I'm better at than other areas. So um, sometimes I find uh, with the standard, like with this activity, since I got to pick just a couple, I think I picked ones that are sort of more aligned with, you know, where I'm strong. But I know that, you know, when you're using the standards in a full course with um, adult 
uh, learners, you know, you have to cover all of them, the whole range, not just the ones that I'm comfortable with. So that's where I see the, the standards and having the structure of the standards um, and starting with the standards push, can kind of push you in that direction. That's just for me, but I think, you know, probably people who have a lot more teaching experience and things like that maybe don't, but but, I think you know, rely heavily on their own areas of, you know, comfort. I'm curious what you guys okay. think too um, about one, one thing I appreciate about the standards is um, if you look at the different, the way that the same standard changes over the levels, I think that's really, really helpful yeah. in terms of thinking about how you're going to uh, structure your lesson. And that actually came up today. Um, it may have been an offline conversation with, uh, with Martin, but he asked a really, really good question. When he did his reading level, he went into, I guess it was probably word where, you know, you can have it, pull back what the reading level was. His reading level was much higher than what he was targeting within his standard. And I think, Lisa, you made a, a really good point as far as if you look at the progression of how that standard changes over the level, that doesn't necessarily correlate perfectly with like a reading level. I don't know, Lisa, do you want to kind of, that was a great question today. I don't know if there's a way you can paraphrase the question and then, and then maybe talk about what your answer was, but it was a great question. It was a great question, and in his work, he was using um, uh, job ads uh, in the newspaper that tended to be higher than the level that he was originally approaching, which was a level A, and job descriptions tend to be at a higher reading level. The approach he used of cooperative learning and stuff like that probably would have been okay for a lower level, but in terms of matching the standard, I suggested that he go back also to the NRS, the National Reporting Standards, that would be equivalent to about third. So given the fact that the materials in his work were uh, taken from newspapers, and local newspapers are usually between, I'd say, six to eight, greeting level, um, within 30 minutes, you don't have time to develop vocabulary and work with that prior to getting into the lesson. So I suggested a higher level with a note to teachers that said, you know, if you do certain things, you can use this with lower level students. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, JR? Our question guy? <laughs> uh, it's Twitter's like really quiet this time because everyone, I guess, is actually in it's the room here. with us. Yeah. <laughs> We're all here. Yeah. Um, there aren't any more in the Q and A, and I don't think I've seen anything uh, in the regular chat either in terms of questions. Okay. Well, I don't want to hold anybody, so this is just totally a night for everybody to um, to ask your questions. So I'll kind of be quiet for a second and see if any percolate. If, if there's no questions, I'd like to throw a comment to see if there's, if we could start a discussion on it really quickly, but sure. first let's see if there's questions, I suppose. <clears throat> I think you're good to go. Yeah. <laughs> go for it. I, haven't, I haven't really articulated it um, in my mind quite, quite clearly. But it, the basic idea that I wanted to throw out there, which I wanted to see where others stood on it and you know how how they felt about it, was my take as I went through the course was that one, the material was great for everyone in the course as far as improving their instructional design skills. So it was wonderful for me, and I, I thought that the course did a great job of for the people who actually finished creating their lessons, of creating something that would um, help people with their GED, help, help people meet the standards. <clears throat> but what I wanted to throw out there was, there's another perspective, which is the learners. Um, if the learners aren't excited, aren't engaged in the material, then even if it's great at preparing them for the sort of final thing they're getting tested for. In a sense, what I throw out there is the priority is first getting the learners liking it. And secondarily, even though it shouldn't be secondarily, but really, practically speaking, secondarily is the 
um, making sure that it helps them get to the end goal. The first thing is making sure that they are interested in doing it. Once they're interested in doing it, because it's relevant to them, because it engages them, because it's something that's important to them, then comes the aligning it sort of thing. So, so what I wanted to say was, are there any ideas sort of thing, um, or how do people feel about perhaps directing it a bit more towards making it engaging for learners, first priority, second priority, the standards. That, that's the basic idea that I want to throw out there. So just see how people respond. Just, just so I can clarify, when you say learner, do you mean the participants in the MOOC or the end user learner in the adult learning context? Oh, yeah, perfect question. What I mean is the absolute end user, end user the, adult, the adult basic education student. Um, where I'm coming from is uh, one of those earlier webinars, I think the last one, there was a math teacher who uh, worked with the students and a, a black guy, I, I think his name was Malcolm, I'm not sure. But his comment was, make the material relevant to them, to the students, or else you'll just remind them why they dropped, dropped out of school in the first place. Oh yeah, Alphonse, yeah, Alphonse. And, and, yeah, Alphonse, that's it. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I really felt like, like it just was a bit of a kick for me because it, it redirected my focus I'm, I'm excited about what I'm doing. It's all wonderful. I think it's great. It's going to, you know, get them to the end goal. But what do they think? Mm -hmm. I, I'm sorry to say it, but in a sense, what they would think of it was not really the first thing on my radar. And so what I'm throwing out there is um, integrating into the course early on um, more of this. This is for our personas. And so the material needs to be something that the personas actually are motivated to do if it's great but they don't do it what's the point of it right so first of all make it relevant to them and as part of that yes we do all this other stuff of the aligning and the following all the standards and all the principles but first it's material that a adult educator can use because they have the resources and second or in line with that is the the learners actually are interested in this stuff. So it's just a little bit more, I would say, a little bit more of a push to this material. If it, isn't, if it doesn't engage the learners, then unfortunately, no matter how great it looks on paper, it isn't really that useful. Yeah. And you know what, I, I, to, to, to um, give, give, give um, Lisi a chance, I think Lisi probably fielded 999. <laughs> uh, like what, is, what do you mean by real world and make it relevant? And um, I, that, to your point, Edward, that is going to be definitely a section of, of a module or maybe a module of itself is helping people get their heads around what does that actually mean so you know Lisa do you want to take a stab at, at that like um, your thoughts on how we could make it so we're not it seemed like it was a little backwards we were people were kind of <clears throat> talking describing their lesson and then we were coming in on the backside saying it doesn't sound like it's going to be real relevant for um, an adult learner and then we had that conversation so any thoughts on that Lisa I think uh, from what I noticed is there was an attempt right in the first part saying this has to be, and there was, I forget the name of the author who wrote about real world problems, but people don't understand what that means. Uh, when I teach, I use real life content. And so they say, okay, writing is a real world, yeah. uh, is a real life problem. You have to know how to write. And the, the idea that you use writing to get what you want. Writing in itself is not a life skill. Math, fractions, we use them every day, but that's a tool to achieve a goal. Why would you use fractions? So I, I totally agree with what you've said. And uh, over and over, uh, research tells us back from Malcolm Knowles, you, in, you first engage the student, then you do your other stuff. Mm -hmm. Yes, we want them to become good writers and uh, we want them to compute and we want them to get ready for college or work, but they're not going to be there if we start out that way. We have to start where they are. And if it's in construction, if it's in 
measuring for medical reasons, whatever it is, that's the hook. Mm -hmm. And I think that people try to do real world, but the way they interpret real world is everybody needs math, everybody needs grammar. Well, do they? <laughs> do I need to understand a subject verb and do I need to understand verb tenses in order to to get what I want? I don't. So these are tools and maybe in the next course that can be more clarified with more examples. This is not and this is it is. So I think that Tying yeah. back to what we were talking about with Jesse, I, I really consider what we do as designers, we're, we're designing learning, we're designing experiences. The same way you would, if you're designing a, you know, a movie or your, what a story or whatever it might be. And so uh, you have to think of the hook. We talked about that. I know how many times have you typed that, Lisa? Like, what's the hook? Like, why would someone even be interested in starting this lesson? And so that's why a lot of times it's kind of funny. I, I kind of become a broken record. I think like the whole he said, she said debate. <laughs> Like if you want people to look at two points of view, like make it a like a customer service, like so what they have like on that TV show, like what, what would you do or whatever, <laughs> you know, something super yeah. compelling where there's two very interesting cases to, to consider. You know, I know a lot of people, and I'm kind of going forking on your, your thing, but a lot of people were a little discouraged that they couldn't find uh, texts that were available. And again, I think that's why I became a designer. I love creating scenarios. Like create your own scenario. It, you know, just put your little writing cap on and uh, and can come up with some something that would be compelling for for somebody to to, to sit through and consider. So, um, but your point is really well taken, and we're definitely going to consider a way to front load that uh, a little bit better. Mm -hmm. The um, so speaking of making the the materials relevant, there have been a, a couple of questions that came in that are circling around this idea of the iterative process or the iterative process of, of designing your materials. And if we have a sense um, of how many of our participants were either testing out some of the materials along the way or uh, maybe a framework around using that type of iteration and getting the materials in the learner's hands during the duration of, of the course itself. So um, I'd like to hear some thoughts around around that as well. Yeah, I think that was, um, Ruth had kind of back channeled the question to me. Um, I think that's probably coming from her. And I'd love, I wish we had time. When we talk about evaluation, all we're really doing is kind of like a peer review of our um, formative evaluation. But if you really dig into like what you're supposed to be doing in a formative evaluation, you're testing out with the learners is certainly um, something you should be doing and unfortunately you know the interest of time and, and also probably practicality I'm not sure how many people could um, just go find a classroom to go test out their lessons but that doesn't mean you can't have like your roommate or whoever may be you know look it over and, and give it a whirl like see if the exercise flows like you think it should you know that's certainly a great suggestion however and I'm, again I, as soon as I feel the question I, I shoot off on another tangent um, another organization we've been interested in working with is um, Digital Promise, and they have what they call Beacon uh, programs, so they're adult education programs. And one of the things we had, I had a preliminary conversation with, uh, with um, people at Digital Promise was, wouldn't it be cool if they could pilot our lessons and then kind of take it to that next, maybe we would even have an entire course where it's just an evaluation of modules created in a prior session. And then we'd have the opportunity to have them tested out on learners and then go through the evaluation um, and revision process, as JR was saying, the iterative process of amending the lessons after they were actually in the, um, used by real learners. But I'm, I'm, I'm anxious here. Anybody else have any other suggestions on within the constraints of our current course that we could try to get um, these lessons in the hands of, of, of instructors and learners? Well, is there going to be a list of, um, of uh, courses or, or plans that were developed in this so we can just click on that? Because I work with adult ed people all the time, and I'll just share the list, you know, try these out. Because they're hungry for content to pre be presented um, without the textbook. And, uh, but I think any developer can find, if that were a course requirement, um, 
there are, um, at least in the United States, there are adult ed programs everywhere. Just drop them by and say, try this. Yeah. And I think it would be cool to have a, an entire evaluation class once we get, a, say we get 50 lessons done. I think it'd be really cool to, um, to have partner up with some of those and have like a more formalized evaluation process and maybe even have some people sit in the room while the lesson's being delivered, things like that. I think that could be really cool. Yeah, do some video clips. Yeah. Oops, I think, did I, did I get that to everybody? I just put in, uh, no, maybe that was just a Ruth. Hang on a second. Did everybody get a, a, a to answer your question, Lisa, Lisa, we do have all of them aggregated on um, OER Commons, those that are the ones that we've worked on. That are listed as coming from this course. Yep. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I really like that, the possibility of that idea that there would just be like an evaluation type course because that is one thing lamented uh, by many instructional designers I know is like they if if even if we go back to Addy it's like okay there's evaluation at the end but like nobody really does that yeah. it's like we always run out of time or it's uh, you know the next project comes on or it fizzles out or whatever happens it's like that's the one thing that's uh, usually the first to go yeah and it totally ties into what Edward was saying too until you've tried it with a learner you really don't know you know you don't know how it will work so, well, we've come up against our hour, and I, I'm happy to stick around myself, but certainly, you know, we don't like to keep these any longer. If anybody has any other questions, I am more than willing to stick around. Otherwise, thank you guys so much for all of your support, and this has been so much fun, and I'm sad to see. I'm, I'm excited to see the end product, but I'm sad to have the experience. Um, thank you. Is that it? Going once, going twice? <laughs> I think that's everyone. Okay, thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Have, have a great night, everybody.